to work your spirit produces the truth and so we continue to pray that your spirit will teach us not only teach us but also transform us into the image of Christ as we open your word together in Jesus name Amen. Amen. This morning I want to talk about the sanctity of solitude. The sanctity of solitude. You may ask, what is the sanctity of solitude? It is the ultimate importance of quietness and rest on your journey. The ultimate importance of quietness and rest on your journey. Turn with me to the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 6, beginning at verse 30. Uh, this is a narrative. Gospels are narratives. A narrative tells a story put forth a story, uh, gives uh, in the midst of the story historical doubt, things Jesus actually said and did, places he actually uh, visited. And so uh, this is an occasion in the life and ministry of Jesus and his uh, disciples. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and talked. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So he left by both for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving, and people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. King James translation calls it a desolate place. And it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. But Jesus said, you feed them. Well, what, they asked. We have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. Mm -hmm. The ultimate importance of quietness and rest on your journey. All of us on the journey. Amen. Sometimes we call it our life journey. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of us call it our Christian journey. The theologians call it the theos, our journey toward God. We are born out of eternity into time, and we have so much time that God gives us. We don't know how much, but we got some. And then we journey back to eternity. So we're on our way back to God. We'll meet him at one place or the other, and for sure, all of us will spend eternity somewhere. Amen. We'll either spend it in the presence of God, yeah. or we'll spend it in the lake of fire, yeah. which is eternal damnation. But this sermon isn't about the lake of fire, it's uh, more about the journey itself. 
It's about what we learn from this occasion, this episode in the life of Jesus. Earlier in the chapter, Jesus had sent his disciples out two by two to the surrounding towns and villages. He sends them to preach the gospel, to heal the sick, and to cast out evil spirits. They've gone out, they've done this ministry, and now they return to Jesus and they're giving him the report. They're telling Jesus all the things that they have done. And all the while, people are just coming and going and coming and going. And there's so much activity and so much going on. And they're trying to meet so many needs of all different kinds that they didn't even have time to eat themselves. Jesus seen this. He says to them, let's go off by ourselves. That's the principle. That's the principle. Let's go to a quiet place so that we can be alone. There are three dangers that all of us face on our journey. From the text, the narrative, the first danger is the danger of not getting enough rest. Someone put it this way, if you don't come apart to rest, you'll come apart at the sea. Come on now. Do I have anybody that's just so busy? Your life is so full. You're doing so much that you're not even getting enough rest. Notice as you read the narrative, and it's not uh, in the part I read, but uh, in, in, in the part thereafter, after Jesus sends the disciples uh, away, Jesus goes up into a quiet place by himself to be alone with the Father. Are you still with me? Now, um, you, you, you got to know that since Jesus required time alone with the Father, mm -hmm. and he's the Son of God, yeah. and Jesus, watch this, needed time alone. He needed quiet time alone with the Father. If you and I are to be successful on our journey, you and I also need some time alone, some quiet time with the Father. Uh, one theologian called it practicing His presence. So how often do you practice His presence? And what do you mean by practice His presence? How often do you get alone? Now listen, Jesus even separated himself from the disciples, from the twelve, from the three, Peter, James, and John. And he went to a quiet place by himself to practice the presence of the Father. Why? Because that's when you can hear God. When you are alone, when it's quiet, and you are focused on listening to what God has to speak into your life. Otherwise, you're so busy doing what you're doing, going to and fro, and meeting so many needs of so many other people that you never slow down enough to hear what God is speaking into your life. My Lord. If you don't come apart to rest, you end up coming apart at the seams. So the first danger on the journey is the danger of not getting enough rest. The second danger on the journey is the danger of getting too much rest. This means that we should prioritize our day and seek balance. Now, if you notice in the narrative, Jesus sends the disciples onto a boat, and they are crossing over. Are you still with me? And once they 
leave all the people uh, they see that they leave they see where they're heading so they're, they're going across the lake on the boat and the people run ahead and now not only are they running ahead but as they're running ahead of the boat they're telling everybody that they meet Jesus is headed that way Jesus and his disciples, I think they're going over here. I, I, we're going to meet him. And, and they're running, and they, they get ahead of the boat so that when the boat gets there, the people are waiting on them. Now, they left where they were to get away from people, and when they arrive where they're going, the people are waiting on them. Isn't it like that somewhere? Sometime in your own life? You know that you need some time. Do I have anybody? And so you try to arrange some time, but then you get to the place where you thought you would have some time and find out that there's a need there that, that you've got to meet. Right, now watch this. Jesus starts meeting the need even though he had sent them across the water to get rest once they get there, the crowd is there. The crowd has a need. He immediately starts ministering to the need. He said, well, wait a minute. I thought they were going out to rest. What you miss in the narrative is that the whole time they were on the boat, crossing over the lake to the other side, that was time that they could rest. And as far as Jesus was concerned, the boat ride from one side of the lake over to the other side of the lake was adequate time to rest and be ready to minister to the needs of the people. Right. Now watch this, watch this. That simply means that there must be some priority in your day. You, you, you watch this, you've got to seek balance. Your body seeks balance. You know what? If your blood pressure is too high, that's bad. It can kill you. If your blood pressure is too low, that's bad too. That can kill you. Why? Because your body seeks balance. If, if your blood sugar is too high, that, that can kill you. Are you still with me? But also, if the blood sugar is too, it's too low, that can kill you. You know why? Because your body seeks balance. Listen at this. There are 24 hours in a day. There isn't a day that has more than 24 hours. And there isn't a day that has less than 24 hours. Every day that you live, God gives you exactly 24 hours. Now watch this. There are eight hours to sleep. Eight hours for work. And eight hours for other things. If you sleep too much, you won't have enough time for work and other things. If you work too much, if you won't have enough time for sleep and other things, if you do too many other things, you won't have enough time for work and sleep. And so even in the day that God gives you, God wants you to priority, make a priority for every day that he gives you. A well-balanced day, isn't it this, is eight hours for sleep. How many hours do you sleep? <laughs> eight hours for work. How many hours do you work? Eight hours for other things. How many hours do you spend doing other things? Now, when you get to the other things, worshiping God, church, and a whole lot of other things come into that eight hours. But watch this, Matthew 6, 33 tells us about these eight hours. Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things 
shall be added unto you. All these, all these things shall be prioritized in your life. You will have a well-balanced life. Listen, you will get enough sleep. Yeah. You will have time for enough work. And you will have enough time for all those things that the Holy Spirit prioritizes in your life that only you can do because God only made one you. Listen, there's the danger of not getting enough rest. There's the danger of getting too much rest. And finally, there's the danger of losing sight of the needs of other people. You remember the disciples got off the boat and Jesus he, he, Jesus, Jesus already teaching and he, he taught them many things. The disciples, they're, 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 they're helping, they're assisting, and they're tired. Anybody been not tired, but tired? Oh, you know, they, they're tired, and, and so it's getting late in the evening, and, and so the disciples are okay, well, if he'll stop preaching after a while. <laughs> <laughs> Got time for him to sit down, you know. And so, so uh, Jesus finishes ministering the word. And so the disciples say, okay, here's the opportunity. So they rush up to Jesus and say, uh, listen, Lord, uh, it's getting late in the evening. And uh, this is a barren place, yeah. a desolate place, a quiet place. This, this, we actually came here. You know what they're, they're trying to remind? We actually came over here for rest. But they already had rest on the boat. I don't have nobody. So Jesus says to them, and, uh, and, uh, because they said, uh, send the people away. Mm -hmm. yep. well, get rid of these people. Are, are you still with me? And, and you know, sometimes there are people in our lives that we want to get rid of. Yeah, come on now. Mm -hmm. I'm coming out of church. Am I preaching yet? That's sometimes it doesn't fall. We want to do away with you. Want, you just want to avoid. You know, sometimes you see them in the grocery store. You go down the other aisle because you're like, oh no, not, yeah, yeah. but 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 Jesus, it's not like that. Jesus said, you feed. They said, Lord, send them away so they can feed themselves. Jesus said, you feed them. Listen at their response. They said, with well, what? You see that? They said, well, we, we hear the attitude in it. Well, listen to that. Well, what? They asked. We, we have to, you know, I can just see them. We have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food to feed all these people. <laughs> you know, I, I can just feel the indignation. You know, we've been, we've been, we've been doing all this ministry on the other side of the lake. Now we've done all this on this side of the lake. Now you want us to feed these people, send them home. Away. Mm -hmm. Oh, but listen. Jesus understands that it is all about other people. Yeah. Yeah. The gospel, the ministry, the church, our lives is all about other people. Why do you get married? So you can pour yourself into somebody, somebody else. else. Come on now. Do I have a church? Oh, yeah. Listen, if you if you if you got married expecting somebody to pour in the pour the pour, do all the pouring. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a marriage, you have a restaurant. You know? Hey, come on. You Let's just go. sit down and wait to be served. But, yeah. but marriage is about submitting one to the other. It's about you pouring. And so Jesus said, you feed them. Three things. Listen, and I'm finished. Three things he wants us to do. Three things. One, evangelize the lost. It's about other people. These are the other people things. Evangelize the lost. You say, well, what do you mean evangelize them? There, there are people who are not saved. People who don't know Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. And he wants us to introduce him to those folk. He, listen, since you're saved and since you know who Christ is and you know how he saved you, he wants you to spend some other things time sharing Christ with the lost. 
evangelize the lost. Introduce them to Christ. Let other people know, people who are lost, let them know that you were once lost, but now you're found. You were once blind, but now you see. There is no secret what God can do when he's done for others. He'll do for you. He wants us to evangelize the lost, but not only does he want us to evangelize the lost, he wants us to exhort the same. Evangelize the lost, but exhort the same. What do you mean by exhort? The same needs instruction, advice, encouragement in the word. And so, while you are evangelizing the lost and that other thing's time, you also need to prioritize some time so that you can spend with your same friends and Watch this, instruct them in the word. But now you have to know enough about the word to instruct. If you don't know enough word or you don't know anything about the word, uh, you can't instruct anybody. Mm -hmm. Right of Hebrews said to the Hebrew Christians, listen, by now you should be teachers of the word, but you need milk because you're not able to receive meat. It was an, an indictment on them and their growth and development. And then he wants us to encourage the weak heart. Listen, in your day, that was 24 hours, if you're not spending too many of them sleep, and if you're not spending too many of them working, but if you have salt balance in your life, then you, you, you're going to work some, you're going to sleep some, and you're going to use some for other things that God prioritizes in your life. Among those things will be evangelizing the lost, exhorting the saved, and encouraging the weak hearted. You listen, God will bring somebody into your life who is weak hearted. What do you mean by weak hearted, Pastor? They feel like giving up. They're ready to throw in the towel. That they're disgruntled, dismayed, disillusioned. They're tired. They're sick and tired of being sick and tired. They don't think things will ever change. They don't think their life will ever change. And they're walking with their head down. They're hoping that the car will just run over them. They're just ready to check out. And there are times when you bump right into those folks. Father. And God has place you in between those people and despair so that you can encourage them. Mm. Sometimes, listen, it's not the pastor that they'll listen to. Sometimes it's the sheep that yeah. they'll listen to. Yeah. It's, it's somebody mm -hmm. whom they can identify with. Somebody, you know, when you can say, well, you know what? Uh, now that you have shared with me what you're dealing with, it, it's amazing. I have dealt with that myself. I have been through that in my own life. I know it's difficult. I know it's hard. But God brought me through. Yeah. And I know God will bring you through. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Help us, Lord. Mm. Those who are weak hearted and need encouragement, who best to encourage them than those of us whom God yeah. has raised up? Yeah. Mm. Praise God. I heard Charles Stanley say this morning as I close, the condition of your heart dictates the direction of your life. Mm -hmm. Which way are you headed? Mm -hmm. Have you had your heart checked? Mm -hmm. Old folk used to say, in New Jerusalem where I grew up, I didn't understand it then, I understand it now. But they give up, they get up and give the testimony. You know, and, and, and sure enough, they're gonna say, my heart is fixed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my mind is yeah. made, up. made up. Yeah. Nothing's going to stop me, mm -hmm. separate me. You know what? And when they, when they get through with all of that, they'll say, you know what? I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God has brought me from such a mighty way, long ways. He's done so much in my life. And I know that I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm not what I need to be, but thank God I'm also not what I used to be. I'm on my way to glory. I know that when I get there, I'm going to sing and shout, and nobody will be there to put me out. Why? Because I got my mind on Jesus. My heart 
and my mind made up. made up. There won't be a pandemic to discourage me. Yeah. There won't be a, a national uh, election to discourage me. Why? Yeah. Because my heart, my mind, my eyes fixed on Jesus. Yeah. Yes, sir. And watch this. The condition of your heart dictates the direction of your, of your life. You may be here today. You may say to yourself, how shall I respond to the preached word? We preach for a response. We're hoping that if you're there and you're not saved, if you haven't received Christ as Savior, that you will receive him today. Even if you're listening by way of uh, Facebook uh, broadcast, and uh, we receive uh, uh, encouragement from people in Haiti and Kenya and, and all over the United States who are listening uh, by way of Facebook. And, and, and so we are reaching out uh, by way of the Holy Spirit for all those who are listening, wherever you are in Facebook land, if you don't know Christ, as your Savior, you can know him today. You know what? He died for you. He paid your sin debt on the cross over 2,000 years ago. He wants you to believe that he loved you that much that he took your place on the cross. Do you believe that? When you receive him as your Savior? If so, you simply pray this simple prayer. Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I've said things, I've done things that are wrong, but right now I turn from the sin in my life and I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. With my mouth I confess him as my Lord and Savior. In my heart I believe that you raised him from the dead. And right now, according to your word, I am saved. Amen. And we pray that you have prayed that prayer somewhere out there in Facebook land in that you are encouraged to know that your life will never be the same. As we stand today, it may be someone here in the building who does not know Christ and Savior. Maybe you're here in the building and you want to receive Christ. Or you're looking for a church home, a church family. We invite you to come.